this might be one of the most important and controversial episodes of Life and Music that I've ever put out. Uh, and the reason being is, I'm going to tell you some things that no one, no one in the industry ever mentions. No one. And really, I mean, I'm sure that somebody has, but their voices are are drowned out and squelched out by, I don't know what, but they, nobody ever talks with any, you know, serious depth on what I'm going to tell you, especially in the industry. And artists don't talk about it because if they did, if they admitted things that I'm going to tell you, that total integrity of their art would be called into question. And I'm guilty of it as well. And everybody that I know is, is guilty of it. But it's never talked about. And it needs to be talked about because the things that I'm going to describe to you pretty well ended the music industry in the early 90s and no and and, and the music industry and, and making records uh died that part of the industry died apparently forever and nobody even get invited to the funeral There was a time when music, and I'm talking from the 50s, you know, late 50s, well, early 50s too, but the 50s right until the early 90s, late 80s, when the only way to make music was on two-inch tape. That was how you, you made records. Giant spools of two-inch tape that were, you know, that sat on a machine that was worth a million dollars that separated the, the two-inch tape into 24 tracks. And that's how you made records. You, had, you could plug in 24 microphones, 24 inputs, whatever. And the engineer would hit record and you'd play. And if you managed to get through a take, that would be saved, hit stop, go a few feet forward in the tape, start again, do another take, multiple takes would would happen until you felt you had done enough of them that you did nail one of them. The only way at that time to fix a mistake in on a tr on a single track now that is if it was isolated when it was recorded and what I mean by that is you know if you're in the studio with a bunch of guys in the same room and everybody has a microphone some of the drum sounds coming through the guitar mic, some of the fiddle sounds coming through the bass mic, on and on that goes, right? So bleed, they call it, was very detrimental to trying to fix, you know, mistakes on two-inch tape. So got to be where, now think about this for a second, the Beatles made all of their records sitting in the same room, even with the drums there. And you listen to the quality of those recordings that were done on two tracks. And you start to realize how fucking brilliant George Martin and the Beatles were. 
Later on, studios started to build ISO booths, isolation booths for drummers, because they were the loudest thing. So they put the drummers in a room where nobody could hear them except the engineer and the people in the studio who were wearing headphones. And then vocalists started to get their own booths so that their track could be manipulated easily without the rest of the band bleeding into their microphone. And the way this was done was very simple. The engineer, engineers used to be magicians in those days. They would play the track, and just at the mo moment, right before the mistake, they'd hit record while the tape was going, and the person would fix the mistake, and they'd hit stop and get them out. That's called a punch in and a punch out. And if those points weren't perfect, like right on the beat of the music, you'd hear it. You'd hear it. So it had to be redone again. And that's how mistakes were fixed. You would literally punch in a few seconds of recording on top while the tune was playing. At re in real time, you'd wait, wait, wait. Here comes the mistake. In. And the guy would do, would do what he was supposed to do. And, and as soon as he was finished that, out. And it, man, it was an art form to find engineers who were capable of doing that. It required engineers to be musicians, which they often were. And there was a lot of them. I mean, there has been so many great engineers, recording engineers, that they're not credited with what they did to to create some of the greatest music that's ever been made had to do with not only the band and the band's vision and the band's ability, but the engineer's ability to capture it sonically, electronically, onto a two-inch piece of tape. So at that point, th then, there would, then you would mix these 24 tracks down to two tracks. That was done physically. Once you played it back and you set all the faders and EQs and effects the way you wanted them, you would then play the, the song and record it out of the 24 track onto a piece of one inch tape that was two tracks, left and right stereo. And then the engineer would sit there for hours, literally with a, with a razor blade and scotch tape and physically edit the tape so the songs were in the order they were supposed to be, so the space between them was exactly what they were supposed to be on the record or the CD, all sorts of things. But they literally did this with a razor blade and scotch tape. That's how editing was done, physical editing of reel-to-reel -reel magnetic tape. That's how everything was done. There was no, there were no computers anywhere in a recording studio. It just didn't exist yet. And as I said, I made my very first recordings in studios like that. And I also had the honor of, rec of recording in studios in Nashville that were that, you know, that were, that were two inch tape studios uh, they had a main recording room and they had an editing suite with another 24-track machine in there and a two-track and an editing desk and where the, where the guy just sat there with speakers and a razor blade. And did, I mean, it's just unbelievable the amount of work that, that the engineers went through to, to create something that the consumer would buy. They're unsung heroes, unsung heroes, recording engineers. Not only that to do that, but they had to put up with, you know, all the egos and the bullshit and the drugs and the, and the alcohol and the stupidity and the drama that went along with many recording sessions down through the years with everybody from, you know, husband and wife teams fighting to, to you know, world-class rock bands in there tearing the place to shit. Engineers had to put up with all this, right? And, you know, some of them were just musicians they, that, you know, could maybe couldn't make it the way they wanted to or they, 
I mean, engineering paid well for the most part. And, you know, these guys were just on the front line and never recognized. That's a fact. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. All things evolve. And necessity is a mother of invention. And I'm sure that there were engineers, you know, all through the 80s when music began to be more complicated. Production values were increasing. There was just more being done. Music was becoming more complicated. You know, mixing it, recording it, editing it, repairing it, all these things. And, and somewhere along the way, uh, engineers got together and said, there must be a better way to do this. Computers were starting to appear around, powerful ones. And so in 1989, a software company designed a, a piece of software called Pro Tools. And so Pro Tools started out, I, if I'm correct about this, I believe I am, as just an editing tool. So the way Pro Tools worked was pretty simple. You could dump all 24 tracks off your tape into a computer. It would show up on the screen as sound waves or wave waveforms. You could see the music in a strip. And a little cursor, a little play bar would scroll across the screen while the music played, and you could see you could see the music. So at that point, editing the music became simple. It was all a matter of just highlighting a piece that you wanted to remove or fix, and you could do it anything you want to. And it was in the early days, it wasn't very powerful, but it was powerful enough that it caught on and it took some time for that to happen actually quite a while really and but i remember being in nashville in the early 90s 92 3 and 4 in there and 95 to a certain extent where i was going into studios and seeing computers sitting around and uh it was <laughs> It was a little unnerving, uh, also amazing. I was like, wow, you can do that? Yeah, oh yeah, we can do that. And and that was literally, you could, you could look at that screen and take a single note. You could see the note happening. You just take it, cut it out, take, a, take the, the same note from somewhere else in the song, cut it out, and paste it. Bang. No more need for punch-ins. No more need for razor blades and scotch tape. Like, no, just incredible technology at the time and a boon to engineers who went from being audiophiles to becoming basically computer programmers. And everyone started to learn the skill set because it was obvious that this was going to become the industry standard. It was, it was so amazing what could be done with Pro Tools that there was no way around it evolving into what it has become today. So, but at that time, it was not used to record. It was an editing tool only. And, of course, in the middle... In the mid-90s, CDs were coming to bear, which also made sense because you could, you could master out, you know, you could, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but they, there was, because there's a number of options they could have used, but you could master right out of Pro Tools through outboard gear and create a digital file that would be used to create the your glass master or your CD blank or whatever the hell you were using, this system streamlined all of that to the point where it really made engineers' jobs a lot easier. And the product would it kept getting better and better. The output became really um, high quality.
right? High quality, especially when you're dealing with trying to get, you know, uh, high fidelity uh, tracks to to come out in 16-bit digital format on a CD. So that very slowly and gradually started to become uh, the the industry standard. It started to computers started to show up in studios more often. Um, the software developed, I mean, a new version came out every year. Uh, pretty soon, uh, well, well, we'll stop there for a second. So, alongside of all this, at, see, at the same time as this was happening, a little company in, I believe in California, I, I think, uh, called Antares, designed a piece of software that, well, I'll make my pronouncements afterwards, but I'll, I'll just tell you what it, it did. And when you, when you think about the ramifications of this, this should scare the shit out of you. They designed a piece of software that could scan in real time uh, a, rec a recording of a vocal, right? Not, a, not the whole song. They would just put it on the vocal track. And it acted like a guitar tuner does it 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 was programmed to to make everything at a440 same way as you put a guitar tuner on your guitar and you hit the string the needle would show you shows you whether you're sharp or flat or on this thing used the same idea except it instantly changed the note to to 440 if it was flat it would raise it and if it was sharp, it would lower it. And it could do this in real time. So this technology is not new. I mean, there was a thing called a vocoder that electronically... But, you I mean, when you put a vocal through a vocoder, it didn't sound human. This thing maintained, to a certain extent the original quality of the vocal. So, to a certain extent. Uh, so that software started to be developed in the mid-90s and came out as a consumer product in 19, September of 1997. I was in Nashville in 95, and I was in a studio up there I don't know what I was doing. I was recording with somebody, and I went into the bathroom, and in ba every every studio in Nashville or anywhere you go, really, there's reading material in the bathroom and magazines. And it's always, in Nashville, it was always trade mags and guitar, you know, acoustic guitar player, guitar mags, all like all those different kind of magazines. And I picked up, I don't know, a fa one of the famous publications, and I was sitting on the throne there, reading this magazine and I came across a full page ad in the middle of the of the magazine and in this full page ad it was an ad for Antares Autotune which really which wasn't out commercially. You could like consumers were not gonna be able to buy it because they didn't have anything to run it on. First of all, this is another thing you have to realize is that Apple changed the music industry as well later on, about four years after. So, anyhow, the ad is a picture of a guy at a, at a credenza at his mixing console, and he has a paper bag over his head with two eye holes. You can't see his face. He says he's wearing a paper bag on his fucking head. And the thing says... Uh, I use Antares Autotune on all on, on all my sessions. It's incredible. 
and it's signed unknown, right? The guy doesn't want anybody to know that he uses this software. Think about that for a second. That was their ad campaign. That was their ad campaign. That was the campaign that was getting engineers' attention about this tuning software. And why would an engineer want not want anybody to know that? Well, obviously, there's several reasons. It means that the producer, producer and engineer weren't able to get a keeper t- vocal take on a record. Also, who who are the artists that they're actually using this on? Right? Whose album do you own at that point? Who didn't actually sing their vocal in tune? And had to be artificially tuned, right? This this was the beginning of the end of the music business, of the record industry. Because of what I've just said. When, when Antares Autotune came out officially in 97, about a year and a half later, it went everywhere. Everybody started using it. Everybody started using it. And prior to that, there were tester studios in Nashville, Los Angeles, London, England, the Toronto, Vancouver, the major studios got access to this software earlier than the general consumer. So the first thing that came out in the pop world uh that caught everybody's attention and turned it into uh, you know, it's really a travesty that's hidden in plain sight was Cher's Do You Believe in Life After Love. Her, they used that software as an effect which made her sound and they turned it up on puke to make her sound like she was going through a vocoder. What she was really going through was that software. And it, people, that was a major hit song and people loved it because it sounded freakish, right? But that's how it was done. And it, some, that somehow kind of just pushed auto tune right into the mainstream and nobody noticed because you can dial auto-tune up and down, right? You don't have to put it on puke. You can put it on just enough that if there's a problem with the pitch of the vocal, it will correct it. People misused it. They turned it up too high. The first time I actually noticed this and I found it quite disturbing, actually, was, and I don't mean any disrespect to this artist because she's brilliant. She is, she's brilliant, and she had some really good songs, but an artist out of Nashville named Jody Messina, her, her first hit song was so obviously auto-tuned because, and I'll tell you how you can tell, auto tune is brilliant software, but it puts what I like to call corners in a human voice that don't belong there. When the human voice changes direction and pitch, the the corner, the, the movement between those two notes looks like a hairpin turn. It's round. It, 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 the note switches and the and the transition is rounded. Well, autotune makes that transition a ninety degree angle instead of a hair a gentle hairpin. And you can hear it. You can hear auto tuning for two reasons. You can hear those corners and you can hear 
the perfection of the vocal, which at a certain point in time doesn't sound natural because it's not. It's not humanly possible to actually sing every single fucking note out of your mouth at in perfect tune. It just doesn't happen. The greatest singers in the world ever have slight, and I mean slight, because some people have perfect pitch. I have perfect pitch. I'm able to sing in tune vocals. Roy Orbison, you know, the the Beatles, the I don't care who. They all have some imperfection in their pitch. And including myself, including anybody who's a professional singer, you might be able to sing, you know, 98% in tune. Well, auto-tune makes it obvious that you're singing 100% in tune. So it's very easy to pick out a vocal that's been auto-tuned. It's depressing, actually, in a lot of ways. So I'm going to tell you what this all means. Now, this, this is where the problem lies. Prior to the mid-90s, when computers, and let's, okay, I just want to jump ahead one second too. No, I'll wait, actually. I'll wait for that. Let's just say this much now. Prior to 1995, when things were done mostly on tape and there was no real chance of, you know, easily pitch correcting, there were other ways to pitch correct. One of them was, was, you know, running vocals through a keyboard that had a modulation wheel. You could t- that I, I I know that's been done, where the use the modu- modulation wheel to to manually tune the note that's being sung or played. Right? It's a nightmare. You you don't want to do it. It takes days and days and days to fix a single song. So there was that. But prior to 95, prior to computers and software being introduced into the mix, there was only one way to get a record deal. And guess what it was? Talent. That was the only way to get into a, into a studio that had a million-dollar Studer 24-track tape machine, an engineer with tons of, of experience. That was the only way. Everybody else was shit out of luck because there was no way to fix somebody who wasn't good enough to be in front of a fucking microphone. So A and R guys at labels, they didn't. If you if they walked in to see a guy play a live show, and the vocals sucked, and were out of tune, or the band wasn't tight, or the, they would look at all that and go, "How does this translate when I put them in front of microphones in a recording studio? Because if they can't cut it, I've just wasted tens of thousands of dollars." To, to try to cut a record on people who can't fucking play or sing. So that meant, that's why music prior to the mid-90s, early 90s was incredible because that was the only way people were able to get into the business was if they were good enough to do so. Everybody else... You know, obviously there's exceptions. Uh, you know, did independent records, and, and some of those people were genius. But the vast majority of them were those who couldn't get a, a real deal because they just weren't good enough. They weren't good enough singers. They weren't good enough writers. The band sucked. They were, and they made records, what they call today or then. They don't even do it. They don't say it today. But then they were called vanity records. They were albums and recordings, usually just one, that were made by musicians who should have never been let into a recording studio, period. 
But at that time, it didn't hurt anything. They were completely harmless. They didn't hurt the industry. They weren't put up against the real artists who had label deals. They weren't distributed by anybody much. They were whatever, right? And then you had all your independent guys. You know, there's dozens of people that we listen to today who all, who who recorded independently and made incredible records. And they just didn't like the industry. And that's a different story. They're fine. But at, before, before the 90s, if you weren't good enough that an engineer could capture your performance with with tape, razor blade and scotch and, and, and scotch tape and make an album that was viable for the radio and to compete with the other, you know, hundred geniuses that were making records, you didn't get signed. That was the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers were just the guys who looked for talent. And if the talent wasn't there, it didn't happen. It wasn't going to happen. There was, you know, there was really no such thing as developmental deals. They happened in those days, but it wasn't the way it, way it was in the 90s when it was like, and, I'll, and I'm going to go into why this became a thing. The next huge development, uh, and we, we owe them, you know, people have... <laughs> Nowadays, it's like, you know, Apple's some big conglomerate villain that does whatever. But we owe Apple untold thanks about, you know, for for doing things that behind the scenes that completely altered our lives and people don't even realize it. And one of the things that they did is in 1999, they came out with the Mac G4 computer. The G4 was incredibly powerful and could run Pro Tools and Autotune and any, you know, a whole bunch of things simultaneously. And, that, and it meant that we were entering into the world where you could record directly to Pro Tools. So you would be at recording at 24-bit right into the software, editing, mixing, mastering with outboard equipment. And you know, there was still outboard equipment being used, but, the, but that computer allowed for things to happen in the industry that, that just had never happened before. So it completely altered studios. I didn't actually... Uh, start, I made, I think I made my last album on another technology called ADAT, which was a tape-based technology, in 1999, but that album was mixed and mastered on Pro Tools. After that, everything I recorded after 1999 was done with a, with a Mac computer, a, a desktop computer. And for actually for a little while, an iMac. And then on to, you know, the G4, and then on and on it goes. It just continued from there. Everything became computer-based, incredibly easy, blah, 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 right? So for professional players, it was a fantastic leap forward in technology. But what it also did... And this is what caused much of the collapse of the industry. It it put it put uh, you know million dollar technology that was in just in recording studios prior to this in the hands of regular consumers, anybody who could afford and and they were expensive. But mind you, I mean it was a lot cheaper than paying a studio to make a record to just go buy a, a G4 Mac, Pro Tools, and Antares Autotune. When I got into Pro Tools, the software cost 600 bucks. Autotune cost 600 bucks. I think I paid $3,000 for my computer, something like that. A studio recording in a, in a studio at an hourly rate would have cost me tens of thousands of dollars. Tens of thousands. 
So this put this technology in the hands of of really great musicians, you know, and home studios started to explode. And with that came, uh, you know, private independent pressing companies who would make your CDs for you. So you didn't have to go through a label. But the other thing that it did was put the technology in the hands of all the people who had been shut out of the business because they weren't good enough to be in the business. And so, and I mean, this sounds harsh, but it is true. Like, there's all kinds of records that you hear and you go, damn, that's just bad. Like, what, what the hell? And these albums were made. They took up space on shelves, they, in stores and all over, right? And they were, and they, they clogged the industry over a number of years with just really bad recordings. This affected everything. It affected, one of the things that affected, which was really piss poor, uh, this is a whole other story, but, you know, we've struggled in Canada for Canadian artists to be played on commercial radio, so much so that CRTC made content laws that 30% of everything that's played on the radio must be made in, in Canada by Canadian artists produced here, blah, 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 right? Well, a lot of radio guys came back at that law saying, yeah, but uh, okay, if you want to raise it up, where the hell are we getting the material? Because, see, they're getting records all the time in radio stations from these guys cutting albums in their living rooms that are horrible. And they're like, well, yeah, it's professionally done, but the music shit. So you really want us to play this on the radio? Like, where are we going to get 30% Canadian content? Like, that's an argument that's been, that may be false, it, it, not maybe, it actually is false. There's more, more than enough Canadian content. But radio guys used it, used all this, all these vanity recordings as an excuse not to play us, right? So they would never look at guys like me or Dave Gunning or Bruce Guthrow or Lenny Gallant or a bevy, hundreds of other Canadian artists that should have been on mainstream radio because they just blanket, they just put us in the pile of, they're not on a major label, so we're not even going to look at that. They just wanted to consider artists in Canada that were signed, right? And that was the wrong thing to do. They should have been pushing the independent guys, the same guys who were independent all along in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a nightmare. It's a potpourri of bullshit. How all of it came, you know, to this perfect storm, this perfect head that affected everything adversely. The Canadian industry of artists, the the record industry, the radio community, the it was just a perfect storm of bullshit that was caused by technology. So here is the just one one, just one of the end results of this entire story. And It's the most important one, and the one that's the most disturbing. Uh, because of because of Pro Tools' ability to, you know, somebody who's using Pro Tools can fix anything. There's no mistake or clam that an artist or a musician can make that cannot be electronically altered after the fact to sound perfect. And then singers are also in that pile now with, with auto-tune, right? It doesn't matter how bad you sing a, tr a cut, a, a track. If the energy is there that you want, auto-tune can make you sound like you sang the track in perfect pitch. 
So what does that mean? Well, here's what it means. I would dare say that 95% of everything that is on the radio or being sold or, or streamed or downloaded or you consumed in any way, 95% of it is not real. It's not real. I mean, how many times, I mean, I've seen it myself. How many times have I heard somebody's record and then they show up on like an award show or I hear them live at a, at a festival or whatever the case may be and you hear them live and they can't fucking sing. They're just pitchy as hell. They're, they're, it's horrible. And you're thinking, okay, well, is he having a bad day or like what, what's going on? It's none of that. It's because they can't sing. And they're signed to a label deal. And they can't sing, right? That's terrifying. It's really terrifying. It's terrifying for a number of reasons. It means that labels can now decide to sign and market someone based solely on their, on their image and their branding. They don't even have to have any real talent. They don't have to be able to write songs. They don't have to be able to sing on, on key. As long as they look a certain way and behave a certain way and elicit some emotional or sexual response from their audience, they're a star. And we as the consuming public just, you know, sort of hear what's going on, but don't realize what we're hearing is 100% manufactured. Completely manufactured. None of it's real. None of it is real. That's, that's terrifying. It's really terrifying. It means you can spend your whole life in this business, doing all the right things, being very talented, able to sing, able to really play, able to write, but yet you'll never make it because some guy across the road looks better than you and has a, has a better persona or a better vibe than you do, physical vibe, right? And the label looks at him and goes, Oh, well, he can't sing as good, but that's okay. We'll just we'll just pitch correct him. We'll find the best songs for him by by some other writer, you know, who incidentally probably should be getting his own deal himself and is not, because he doesn't look the part. Or maybe he doesn't want to perform live. A lot of writers don't want to do that either. So because, as I've described for the last eighty weeks, the industry's poison. I always laugh when occasionally on social media you'll see engineers dropping uh, board recordings of famous, famous singers, right? Current, like today, like current singers, uh, like with their vocals soloed, so you could just hear their vocal, right? And they they release these tracks. Uh, and, and you listen to them and go, oh my God, it sounds like somebody's killing a cat. And, but their records sound great, right? And a lot of artists, you see, they now have also in the last few years have come up with a portable version of autotune in a rack mount box that goes back at the soundboard and you can run the vocalist mic through it. So, like, even live, even live, you can theoretically sing like shit, and, but what comes out of the speakers is perfect. So, what does this all mean? Well, 
What it means is, well, first of all, I'm going to say this. I, I believe I said at the first of the video that I, too, use Autotune. But I use it the way it was intended. And many of the guys that I know that use it, use it as it was intended to be used. And the way it was intended to be used was not just pl plastered on an entire vocal track to make the guy sound like the Tin Man on Acid. I use Autotune to, to fix one word in a vocal. Where the vocal itself is deadly. But there, man, there's one word there. We didn't quite get the note or we went over it. And so I go in and I select that one word and I tune it. And then I turn off the software. Like that's how Autotune was supposed to be used. Very surgically and very lightly. So you can't hear that, that it's being grabbed and manipulated and turned into something it's not. That's That was the idea. And, you know, Autotune, the company, they know this because the, the software has become more sophisticated over the years, much more. And you're able to do that. Like the software is designed to use it sensibly. Not to just plow a whole vocal through it. And, you know, I mean, it's ugly. It's, it's really ugly when you look at what's possible. And how we're all sort of being scammed by this. And when you think that somebody's a great singer, when you hear them in the room without any software, without any technology, they're suddenly not so good. You know, that's pretty bad. Like, that's horrible, actually. And uh, we used to laugh because we used to get down to Nashville once in a while in the early 2000s and talk to my friends down there, and they told me that there were people showing up in Nashville singing, right? They weren't, and they weren't very good singers. They were, and they were singing off key and stuff, but they, they, they emulated and copied the sound of auto-tune in their vocals. So you, what you ended up with was a guy who wasn't a very good singer, but his vocals set, had all those right angle corners. I mean, that's just obscene. You had guys who were singing like auto-tune software because it became so prevalent in the industry that the people that they emulated and, and listened to had those artificial robot corners in their vocals and so that's how these guys sang live in the room. Even, as I mentioned earlier, when I, the first time I ever heard Jody Messina live, she sounded like that. She sounded like she was being auto-tuned, but she was still singing off key from time to time. And holy crap, like that's just like, what is going on? What has happened to everything? Like, what, what, what is the meaning of success in the business anymore? If you can take a guy off the street who looks cool in jeans and, has a, and is a badass or whatever, and you can put him in front of a microphone in a studio with a, with a, with a, with a group of A-list musicians from L.A. or Nashville or London or wherever and cut, cut hit songs and his vocal is so bad that, I mean, potentially, and I've seen it, potentially without the software auto-tuning, you'd never listen to this guy for five seconds. But when he's coming at you through the speakers, singing at, at 440 in every single fucking note, of course you're going to listen to him. Oh, what a great singer. No, he's not. Auto-tune is a great singer. He's not a great singer. He sucks. But the label... And the industry has told you and fooled you and sold you something that's not even fucking real. And so you think, yeah, he's a great singer. No, he's not a great singer at all. The computer is the great singer. He sucks. You know, and you look, I, and, I, and I have to say this as well. Uh, I mean, you look at some of these guys who are just 
elevated beyond belief. Like, I, I listened to Kanye West. Holy shit, that guy's bad. I've heard his vocals, his isolated vocals. He cannot sing. He cannot sing. He just can't. He's not a singer. And, uh, but yet he's a multimillionaire. And he sold millions and millions of records. But the man can't sing. Can't carry a tune. Right? And on the other side of the coin, there are artists out there now, today, everywhere, who refuse to use auto-tuning. And I say all the more power to them. You know, they don't use it at all. As a matter of fact, some people even put it on their CDs in the liner notes. There's been no pitch correction used on this record. And, you know, I'm almost in that school. I, I tend to really steer away from pitch correction unless, like I say, there's a single word or something in a, in a, in a performance that the rest of the performance is just wicked. If I, if I don't feel I can re-sing it and capture the same energy and everything, it's just as easy to go in and select that one word and bring it to pitch. And because I don't sing that far off a pitch, soft auto tunes, not really going to be heard. It'll just make that one note where it should be. Boom. I'm out. So I'm of this. I'm of that old school, right? And it's a lot of guys are. A lot of guys are. There's a lot of guys working today that are like, and you can hear it because their vocals are awesome, but they're human. They're human. They sound human. There's warts and bumps on them. Uh, the idea that an electronically derived vocal is ever going to have any heart or soul or presence, right? It won't. It just never will. Vocals have to be, you know, directly from the singer's heart into the microphone, into the ears of the listener. That was the traditional job of the engineer, to make sure that that happened. And it was the traditional job of the labels and, and, and people in power in the industry to make sure the engineers were delivered musicians who could provide the input that the engineer needed to make a great record. That was the old formula. But now it's not like that. It's not like that at all, and it never will be again. As long as there are people making millions of dollars and selling millions of records who can't actually sing live in a room without a mic, without a computer, without anything, and blow your socks off, as long as that's happening, the industry is going to be a giant fake graveyard. And the graves are populated by the guys who actually were good enough and are good enough to have been given a shot and never were. And there's thousands of them. The only redeeming thing about all of this is that because the technology has become so readily available to just about anybody, viable guys, you know, who are out there working, they can make their own records for no money. Get them out to their fans, create a fan base, go play live, blow people away, and do their thing. And the industry can't do a goddamn thing about it. They can't stop them. They can't influence them. They can't, they can't touch them. And that's the biggest thing to remember about how gross and ugly commercial music has become. Uh, and just remember, if you're a fan of something, you know, uh, that's on the radio all the time or whatever, you need to seriously consider whether or not that person is actually what those radio speakers are telling you they are. If they're, if they, you know, if you, uh, if you take away that blanket of technology that, 
that safety net, right? Their safety net where they can walk in, sing a shit vocal, and if they put enough balls behind it, well, we'll just tune it and put it out. That doesn't work live. Well, unless you get the software live too, which they do. But it doesn't work live in a room. And ultimately, that is where the biggest connection and the most important connection is made between a musician and an audience is in a room, a small room with just enough people in the room so that your own unamplified energy covers everybody's soul. And if you're able to do that, then go make your records. Go use the technology. Don't use auto-tune. Don't capture what you do as true to form as you possibly can. And then if somebody does accuse you of using technology to make you better, prove them wrong, right? Uh, one of the people that did it, actually, because, because her vocals were so perfect, Shania Twain did it. Shania Twain was accused early on of using autotune, and she hadn't. And so the, her, very, her second video featured her singing live on the step in, in a microphone with a guitar. And then it, when it, it bled into the recording. She had to prove to people that it was possible to sing as perfect as she did. You know? And that's sad. That means that someone as talented as her, who became, you know, and a Canadian artist at that, became one of the most, high, the highest selling female in country music history, music history, period, that she had to go and prove that she could actually sing. That's a testament in itself to just how wrong things have gone. But like I said, if you're out there doing this, don't let it get you down. Stay true to yourself. Stay true to your ability. Make music for yourself. And by extension, you'll be making it for your audience. And don't ever give up on them. They're, they're your ultimate critic. You know, if there's something wrong with what you're doing, they'll tell you. They'll tell you. You don't need somebody in a suit to tell you that you're good or to make you good. You either are or you aren't. And that's about all you need to know. <laughs>